All right, here we go. Today we have quite a war band here on the channel and I am so delighted to be spending some time with all these fantastic booktubers. I, I'm gonna just let everybody introduce themselves really quickly. These are some wonderful people. I am subscribed to all of their channels and I definitely urge you to check them out. These are some wonderful people. We have Jimmy here and we have Patrick and we have Alex and Sarah and we have the brothers Gwyn as well, Ed and Will. So all of us have come together to discuss the shadow of the gods. Oh, that so, <laughs> very, very excited for this. And this is actually being recorded before the release of the book. I'm not going to release this video until after. You won't see this video until after the book is out because although we're going to begin with some non-spoiler assessments of the book, we are going to move on to some big time spoiler talk. So uh, we're all very excited to finally, poor Ed and Will have been waiting a long time to talk <laughs> spoilers about this. <laughs> so just real quick guys, if you don't mind, uh, please introduce yourselves. And I'm just gonna start with Jimmy cause you're at the top of my screen. Perfect. Well, I, I think that's a, a good place to start. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Jimmy Nuts. I am the book to beefcake from the Fantasy Network. And, uh, <laughs> you know, mainly what I do over there is a lot of book reviews. And one of the mainstays on my channel has been experiencing John Gwynn's works and just really blowing my mind and a lot of uh, my community's minds. So I'm excited to be here and finally talk some spoilers about John Gwynn. Yay. All right. And a familiar face to many of you. Uh, who've been watching my videos. I've done a few collaborations with Patrick before, and I'm so <laughs> glad that he's back here because Patrick, you are in many ways responsible for a lot of us reading John Gwynn's work. Definitely. So yes. you're kind of the, the pioneer <laughs> here. I feel like I've succeeded at something. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, hi, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Patrick. Uh, uh, I recently started my booktube channel last year and Doing this kind of a discussion with these lovely people have been some of my highlights in my career as a booktuber. Is that a career? <laughs> yes. But yes. yeah, uh, it, it has been a joy and I'm so grateful that I can do another one for the Shadow of the Gods with everyone here. We're glad to have you here. Another familiar face, someone I've <coughs> always enjoyed talking to is Alex Nieves. Alex, how are you today? I am doing well, just petting my dogs that won't leave me alone at the moment. Uh, I'm not quite as beefcakey as Jimmy over here, but uh, excited to talk some John Gwynn because this book is fantastic. Awesome. All right. Well, it's great to have you here. And we have uh, a, a someone I've talked about before on the channel, but I've never had the opportunity to be in a collaboration with her. And I'm so happy that Sarah is here from Sarah Reads. Sarah, hello. Hello, my name is Sarah, as Philip said, from the channel Sarah Reads. I am new to book two, but have been reading fantasy for a very long time. Uh, it, it makes me a little bit old to have some of you guys here. Although, thank you. Thank you, Philip, for being here. <laughs> because I have been reading fantasy for probably as long as the youngest person has been alive. Um, but I am really glad to be here to discuss uh, John Gwynn's works. I am new to his work, but I really have really, really loved it. Kind of read his first seven books in very quick succession a couple of months ago. And I'm really excited to talk about this one. Oh, it's so great to have you here. And finally, we have the brothers Gwynn. And uh, these guys, in case you don't know, probably most of you know, but they are related to the author. Uh, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> no, do not be like me. Patrick a while to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I had I had never read this guy called John Gwynn before, and then I saw Patrick writing on Facebook. And I was like, I need to check out this crazy guy with an axe. So, uh, and here we are. So, uh, it turns out I live with the guy with the axe. So yes, we're hello everyone. We are the brothers Gwynn. Thank you for having us. We are just going to bask in the glory of these uh, wonderful booktubers. Yeah, exactly. We as Philip said we've been waiting so long to talk about the Shadow of the Gods. We read it and then we're like, oh, we'll have to wait almost an entire year to talk about it with other people. So thanks for having us on here. And we're just like really looking forward to it. Awesome. It's, it's just a delight to have you two here and everyone else. So let's dive in here. I want to begin 
I'm going to be the moderator, or uh, if you will. Uh, so I'll be asking the questions, and we'll be just moving around, letting everybody answer. We're going to start with the non-spoiler assessment. So each of you, I'd like you to just give your broad assessment of the shadow of the gods. And if you would like to compare it to the faithful and the fallen and or, and or of blood and the bone, these are the, the two previous series that John Gwynn has written. They are both in the banished lands. This is not in the banished lands. This is in a different place and it has a different inspiration behind it. So that is, feel free to talk about that. The, the old Norse inspiration in here, versus the Celtic Roman inspiration behind uh, the Banished Lands. Uh, but also uh, just how about it, just sort of a why you should read assessment here. Uh, and uh, who do we start with? Let's start with Sarah, actually. Sarah, what do you think? Why should people read The Shadow of the Gods? Well, I think, first of all, if you haven't read John Gwynn's books, I think you should read all of them because they're all fantastic. Why in particular, I think you should read this series is I think, at least to me, this is John Gwynn's strongest start to a series. Faithful and the Fallen or the Banished Lands, they have my heart because I followed those characters through all of those books. And I really do think that John Gwynn builds with each novel his the tension, the character motivations, the plot, everything escalates as the series goes on. And because of, and even within the book, so we get that same kind of escalation here in the shadow of the gods. And given the strength of this start, how invested I felt in the characters, the vibrancy of the landscape and of the world building, and just the intricacies of the plot and how unique some of that was even compared to his previous works. Given that this is just the beginning of this series, I am really excited to, to find out what happens next. And I think if people, even if you're looking to go into John Gwynn's works, I think this is an excellent place to start. It's nice to have that feeling of anticipation too, of, of knowing that there are good books that are yet to come. So I think if you enjoy epic fantasy, if you enjoy complex characters, if you enjoy intricate world building, those are all great reasons to, to jump in here and, and read this one. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, how about the brothers? Ed, Will, why should people read this book? Well, uh, in my opinion, anyway, I think this is, well, disclaimer here, we're not going to be too biased, okay, but um, <laughs> uh, this is, I think, Dad's darkest and kind of most intimate um, take on fantasy, and uh, as we do have a few perks, we're able to talk with him a bit more than most people can, um, although he does put his headphones on a lot to drown out the talking, um, <laughs> to escape. we feel that this is kind of the, the child he's been waiting to write, mm -hmm. you know, the, the book he's been waiting to uh, to explore in the world that he's really wanted to um uh, just having these new ideas after the faith in the fallen so uh, and obviously we are a bit of a, a reenactment family we like the whole viking era and um, so if you are a fan of that but with added giant <coughs> serpents and massive creatures and all sorts of chainmail battles and duels then i think this is a, a good place to start and if you've read the faith in the fallen the shadow of the gods is a bit darker a bit grittier but the same themes I'd say are at the heart of it, friendship, family, loyalty. And I'm someone who, when I read, I want characters to be at the heart of the story. And The Shadow of the Gods, that is exactly what it's about. Beautiful. All right. Thank you, gents. And uh, Alex, how about you? What's your, what's your non-spoiler assessment? Your why you should read? How do I follow up either of those? Yeah, um, they're good, aren't they? <laughs> some, of, some of what I wanted to say has already been said, but for me, Having read Faithful in the Fallen and having some issues with the first book, but then like all that being wiped away and just ended up being one of the best series that I've read. This one did feel a lot more intimate in scale, just from the amount of POVs that you have, because you really only have three characters that you're focused on. It reminded me almost of First Law in a way of sort of the gritty feel to it, but also just the way that the POVs are going about their ways throughout the book there's not like a central like good versus evil necessarily plot like right off the bat or anything like that you're really just following these different characters and I feel like with that John Gwynn has I haven't read of Blood and Bone yet so I don't know how good those characters are but from Faithful and Fallen to this I think this is some of his best character work that he's done and I can feel the the writing improvement from Malice to now and I mean I'm sure we'll all talk about Orca here shortly 
one of the best characters I think he's ever written, if not the best. And just the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the way that he can make you feel for characters so quickly with so little, like it, it doesn't take long to be attached to these characters. And I think that's one of the best things that he does. And then of course, all the combat and blood and gore and all the, the good Viking uh, war happening as well, where I've, I mentioned it in Faithful in the Fallen before, but it's even better here where the battles feel so close to you like you can almost feel like you're there with just the way that it's written so just the the same praise that i have and many of us have for faithful in the fallen i feel like is even better on display here and that's just from his time of writing and improving as a writer and i can't wait to see what book two has uh brothers gwen since you've read it already cheating <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> I can't, the, the i'm not show off or anything but... <laughs> Yeah, they can't say anything. It's actually torture, but yeah, that's <laughs> torture for us as well. Yeah. All right, Patrick, how about you? What's your assessment here? Uh, I think I will just, uh, in addition to what everyone has said, I will just say about the Norse mythology part because uh, I always feel, I always felt that in The Faithful and the Fallen, there, there is a few Norse mythology inspiration in The Faithful and the Fallen, but there's only a few. But, and I've only I've always said this that it would be amazing if John Green one day write a Norse inspired epic fantasy and here it is and he delivers everything I wanted in this uh, first book of a series and knowing John Green uh, even though I love this book so much I think this is his most well polished start to his series yet I, uh, I think the best book will come in the last book because mm. John Green is always the best at the final book in my opinion. Yeah. in my opinion and yes you should read the shadow of the gods oh yeah excellent excellent okay jimmy last but not least what's your um non-spoiler general assessment of the shadow of the gods to, to explain why i think you should read shadow of the gods uh <laughs> i would have to relay to you why i trust john gwen as an author uh, whenever mm. I go and I give money and I, I purchase one of his books, uh, I have an expectation that he fulfills. And with Faithful in the Fallen and of Blood and Bone, he took things that felt very familiar in the fantasy genre, but he made them feel fresh. And he took a new take on it with a different type of pace and a different type of characterization that, quite frankly, no one else in the, in the genre is doing. And when we're talking about John Gwen and we're talking about four, 500, 600 page books, there is nobody who it gets more out of page real estate than John Gwen. John Gwen will get you into a character's head and attached to them and emotionally invested mm. in minimal time. Mm -hmm. No one else is doing that. The secret sauce of what John Gwen's doing, in my opinion, puts him on a Mount Rushmore of modern fantasy. <laughs> and when we talk about Shadow of the Gods, we talk about familiar, we talk about having fun with a lot of those old tropes, getting fresh takes. Shadow of the Gods is something completely different. Shadow of the Gods is clearly a man in John Gwen who had a story that started here, mm. okay? Yeah. And then he executed it with a very sharp intellect. And it, it comes through on the page so well. I think it's so efficient. And Shadow of the Gods feels new. It feels fresh and it feels important. And that is why you should read Shadow of the Gods by John Gwen. Beautifully said, beautifully said. All of you actually, I, I've... I want to go reread it now. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> After listening to all of you, so I just thank, thank you so much, and and I'm sure that our listeners, viewers who have not read uh, The Shadow of the Gods yet are going to be even more eager after hearing all of that praise. And I think it is well-deserved. So, but now we are going to move on to some spoilers, finally. So yeah. we're going to have spoilers. So this is your warning. If you have not yet read The Shadow of the Gods, you this should. is your time to, to say goodbye. Thanks for coming. And not everybody had arcs, Patrick. <laughs> Wait, you got one here. too now. <laughs> So we are moving on to some spoilers. And I thought we would begin by talking about some world building aspects of it. Uh, so uh, let's start with magic, <coughs> perhaps. And this is a world that some of you have mentioned, the Norse inspiration. The <coughs> continent where the action takes place is called Vigrid, which is the name of the battlefield in Ragnarok, the, the world ending cataclysm. 
Uh, so there's lots of Norse stuff in here I could go on and on about, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, but this, <laughs> this is a cool illusion, but it also tells you this is a post-apocalyptic world that we're in here. This is a world where the gods are dead and gone, but they are, or maybe imprisoned, uh, but uh, th their influence, their presence is still very much there. Their shadows are looming over this story. Uh, and one of the things they've left behind is magic. Uh, their, mm -hmm. their offspring, uh, known as the tainted, uh, are some of the, a, a big part of the magical system here, although you don't have to be tainted apparently to use magic. Uh, so, but that's a big part of it. And so I'm wondering about you guys, what are your thoughts on the magical system here? The, the Galderman and the Sather witches and all of that stuff, as well as the Tainted. And let's start with somebody new this time. How about Alex? Let's start with you. Yeah, so the magic, I, I don't know exactly what to make of it yet. I'm not well versed in Norse mythology, as, as you may be. Uh, but from what I saw, the, the main thing that drew me in were the tainted, just because when when you're first introduced to them and you, you sort of see like their sharp teeth come out and just how violent these people are, I was just like, what the hell are these freaks? <laughs> <laughs> so like that was really cool. And then like the entire plot line of like them taking tainted children, you're like, okay, somebody's up to something, like trying to, you know, harness this this power. But I, I don't really know. I mean, like you said, the, the gods are dead or imprisoned. But like, as we see, they're not necessarily dead. Uh, so I don't really know exactly where the magic is going. But like, it, it's it's sprinkled in enough to not completely like dominate the narrative because it is still very much sort of like sword and board fighting. But then of course you have like when Orca comes home and there's just like bodies everywhere. Like you could tell it wasn't just like humans. <laughs> That are fighting everybody in these yeah. and i don't know that the magic seems cool i don't know if this is going to be like magic wielders or anything like that or if it's more of just sort of like i don't know if different gods are going to give you different powers anything like that maybe happen but but I i'll let you all discuss as well cool thank you yeah i love that response um jimmy how about you what did you think of the magic here well first off uh if witches are included your boy's in i'm in i'm sold <laughs> We need more witches in fantasy, folks. Uh, you know, I think the magic is, is interesting here, but like Alex said, it's not at the forefront. And I feel like that's part of the reason why I'm jonesing for book two now. Uh, yeah. And John does a very good job of just trickling it in, right? I felt like in The Faithful and the Fallen, magic, it existed, but it was almost like a not sub, <laughs> piece, yeah. right? Like it didn't feel, and then a blood and bone, he leans into it a little more. And I feel like he's kind of found the good balance here in Shadow of the Gods, where we know it exists. Uh, it has a huge weight in the world. And the reason why, to get into that, is because John Gwynn does an amazing job of making everything feel very grounded and then smacking you in the face and going, oh, wait, this is a fantasy world. Right? <laughs> and, and I like that. I like that a lot. So and it's because the characters are relatable. The world is well thought out. Uh, it feels like you could exist in a world like this. Uh, it would be terrible for you, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you could be there. Right. And I feel like I'm walking uh, alongside these characters. And then all of a sudden you see this magic and you're like, whoa, hold on. Right. Um, so he's found a good balance, I think, where it is a mainstay already here in book one. But we're going to learn a lot more about the Tainted uh, and what comes with that, I think, in book two and three. And I like having something to look forward to. We're going to grow into this magic system, for lack of a better term. Nice. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Patrick, how about you? Uh, I think I, I have to agree with both Alex and Jimmy on this because yes. uh, we haven't seen too much of the magic here. We haven't seen too much. <clears throat> Sorry. But by the end of it, uh, we see a lot of magic being used. Uh, we see that with the characters. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's okay to talk spoilers, right? But yeah, we're doing <laughs> spoilers yeah. now. Yeah, so yeah. Go for yeah. it. Unleash yeah, for, spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> for example, like uh, the Bloodsworn, all members of the Bloodsworn uh, has the power to channel the power of the gods here. Yeah. And we, whether you know or whether you didn't know, it's still a, a huge deal to see it unfolding at the end of the book. And especially uh, Orca, the plot twist around Orca. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, by book two, uh, especially considering the title of book two, we will see a lot of magic being used we will see it, I think. 
Don't, don't tell me whether, don't tell me whether that's correct or not, brother Squin. <laughs> <laughs> They're lit for the, maybe. <laughs> what was the title of book two? That God's Rising for now. Uh, okay. Patrick will never <laughs> I could even say it. It's a working title. Okay, so brother Squin, what do you think of the magic so far? How did Papa Gwyn do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love it. I think I love magic in fantasy, obviously, but I don't like it to be too overpowered. And I think that the magic it is it can turn the tide of a battle or conflict, but it can't just wipe away swathes of armies and monsters. And I love how a lot of, with the tainted, how it allows them to physically adapt and change. Um, and that's something that I've not really seen before. And when we um, uh, when we are reading this, uh, Papa Gwyn, he doesn't like to tell us much. He likes um, to keep it mysterious until and then get our actual reactions. And so when we came to the end of Shadow of the Gods and all these plot twists are unraveling um, and the influence of magic, I just loved it. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I really like how it's different to uh, the Banished Lands magic where you've got kind of some different elements where you've got people that are kind of born with magic, you know, that that's who they are. And then you've got people who are kind of trained in magic as well. Yeah. And um, and it might come into play a bit more. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, Who knows? <laughs> this is really hard. <laughs> I told you to adopt me already. <laughs> come on. <laughs> the Patrick papers Wayne. are being sent, Patrick. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, Sarah. <laughs> how about you? What What did you think of the magic? Sure, I, I love the magic system. I am someone who prefers soft magic to hard magic. I like when the magic remains a little mysterious. I think in fantasy, I, I think that that's what I love about fantasy is that it feels magical in this world. The magic system that we're given or the type of magic that the characters possess or use adds to that atmosphere. It's the type of magic that adds to that gritty, dark, moody atmosphere that's being built up. And so I think it fits really well in terms of the story. It integrates well as a piece of the world building. And it's just the type of magic that I like to read about. I it, it gives you insight into the characters. I like that there are, or what there seems to be limits to the magic system. It definitely has a, a physical impact and probably a psychological impact as well to use it. We see that with some of the memory loss that's associated with that. And I really apologize. I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist by trade. So that's my, what I do. So a lot of the um, analysis that I do when I'm reading has to do with that. And it's why I love talking about characters so much. And I, I can pretty much relate anything back to that. And so I do see some of that in the, uh, the magic system as well. And I'm really, really interested to see where it goes from here. But I loved it. It had everything that I enjoy out of a magic system for sure. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to talk about characters in a very spoilery way in, in a bit, but while we're on the topic of world building, something that I really admired in here, there's some real, even though the, the book for me spoke a lot of, it had a lot of Icelandic saga type vibes to it, which is, there's a lot that's understated about Icelandic sagas. And I thought that Gwyn did a marvelous job of, of, succeeding in having that that kind of vibe in there but there are some really epic uh locations in this story that i really just i want to see on a big screen now yeah uh, snakovic for example and the whole the whole mountains you know uh, uh behind it so just briefly let's talk for a moment about the world building and of course if you like you know there's there's ships you can tell that uh, he's you're, he's done his homework when it comes to uh, describing the the ships. I felt like I was on one of those old uh, drakers, one of those old Norse Viking ships. Just be beautifully done, uh, but the, the various locations and the the Norse influence. So let's get your thoughts on that, guys. Uh, and this time, maybe we can start with Patrick. Uh, for before I get uh, to the good things, I would say that uh, I, I love Norse mythology, right? I really love Norse mythology, but even then I still had, uh, I was still shocked by the, the amount of Norse words that I encountered in this one. And uh, it's, it's both good and kind of uh, took some time for me to learn because I need to learn these words. I need to search them because I didn't understand some of the words being used. 
but after I learned about them, well, it's it became more uh, it became more immersive to me. And as as you said, Philip, uh, the world felt like we were inside there with them. It's it felt so vivid, and yeah, the immersion is unreal. It's crazy, crazy yeah. world building. Seriously, yeah, it, it's really beautifully done, and I love that yeah. he's both taken inspiration from the sagas and created his own spin on on and mm -hmm. his own thing. There's some very unique elements in here as well. So, Jimmy, what did you think about it all? Uh, the Boneback Mountains is one of the coolest regions in any yeah. fantasy book I've ever read. Yeah, and uh, I'm not. I'm like Alex. Like I'm not. Like whenever you say Icelandic saga, I have no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> like Philip is so smart. It's ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> it's like but, I'm just sitting in class like, uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. Th th this stuff's <laughs> brand new to me. <laughs> so, so I mean, I've, I've watched, you know, some Viking stuff, you know, blah, 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 blah. But like, I had no idea that that was named, you know, the battlefield for Armageddon, right? For Ragnarok. I didn't know that. So th this is all pieces of nuggets. Uh, the world building to me feels so... Like if it was on film, I feel like it would have like a very cool, grim tint over it, like when they shot it. And <laughs> I like that because you know what that tells me? It means that the the work, the piece of work has atmosphere. And if you get atmosphere, you can get me in and you can get me invested. And then I have a very distinct and I'm not a very visual reader, but I have a very distinct way of the of the lay of the land, right? Of the grim hole uh, in the bone back mountains. I mean, it's a God's spine, essentially. I mean, that is so cool and i'm sure that's in norse mythology but even someone like if you're watching this right now and you're saying i don't know anything about norse mythology that's totally fine because all it feels like is a really well realized world uh and john Gwynn's take on it's really cool the thing i love about world building like this when it's based in some form of mythology or even reality right poppy war did this and john has done this and it's motivated me to want to read other things to get yeah. more involved in, in in the inspiration of the work, Poppy War really got me more interested in Asian history. I I, I just it's a blind spot for me. And now you know I find myself watching YouTube videos, uh, looking at books to read, buying books, and now I really want to read Norse mythology by like Neil Gaiman. I I, I want to like dive more in. So this is a huge win not only for the world that it's set in, but also as a reader, I've been rewarded, uh, you know, by John Gwynn. So that that's pretty pretty dope. That is awesome. By the way, there is nothing that I know of like that mountain range anywhere. Oh, although the closest thing in Norse mythology would be the Midgard serpent Jormungand. So Jormungand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's, it's, I was gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> the words right out of my mouth. You knew about it, right? You knew, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, if that is an original concept that he, you know, yeah. he's sitting in the laboratory just like thinking these things up, that's ridiculous. I yeah, mean, the that is. Back mountains is such a cool thing, and Snakovic, where the head is, where they yeah. build a, a, a city inside of the the skull so of this cool. enormous. That is just so cool. I, I that's thought. So cool. That's I so thought that was just the best piece uh, when every time about scene setting and Philip, I wanted to ask you this because I know you've read memory, sorrow and thorn yes. uh, and Tad had multiple, like, you know, there's some Norse there. There's even a little bit of Celtic there, but yeah. did you feel like the grim Holt was a nod to the hay Holt? I hadn't thought of that, but it could be, I think we should ask uh, the, the authorities uh, here. I, I would love to know. If the brothers win, I have I have a covert ops mission for you. I need you to find out <laughs> if your if your father, Bapa Gwyn, has had a lot of influence from Tad Williams. I'm just curious because after I read Faithful Fall, I read Memory Star and Thorn, and I always thought like Faithful in the Fallen was a very good take on a lot of Tolkien tropes, obviously, duh, right? But I also said, oh, this is like a really fun derivative of like a Song of Ice and Fire. It's not the same thing at all, but I'm just saying like, I was like, oh, I could see some of the influences from that, right? Yeah. But then when I read Memory Star and Thorn, I said, oh, this is <laughs> this is one of the pillars in John's head. I, but maybe I'm wrong. But when I saw Grimholt and I thought Hayhold, I was like, oh, I wonder if that's like a nod. Maybe it's not. But uh, there are a lot of Norse inspired names in Memory Star and Thorn. And I was just like reading it. I don't know. I got like some sort of relation and I had a little bit in Faithful and Fallen. So I'm very curious if your father uh, is a big fan of Tad Williams or not. We could go ahead. And uh, we've actually... Yeah, Dad and I have met Tad Williams uh, once and lucky enough to get some books signed by him. Um, <laughs> so jealous. Up in Python, which was amazing. And uh, now you guys are just fighting on us. And uh, Neil Gaiman was there. And, 
and Patrick Rothfuss. That was really cool. Oh, you guys, did you guys feel like shame? Did you guys feel like shame from the name drops? My God. Well, it was, it was, it was an excuse. We were, yeah, we were just standing in queues, to be honest. But, um, but yeah. Uh, I know that Dad really likes Tad Williams. I'm happy to interrogate him for you, Jimmy. And, yeah, um, Mission shine a light in his eye well, I, and something. Yeah, it's something I'd like to know because the thing, like, Tad and, and John are two of my favorite authors, and they write very differently. But yeah. it, it's cool to see two different takes on some of those tropes and themes, yada, yada, yada. So, like, yeah. I, I don't know. In my mind, those are, like, two of the heaviest hitters that we have. And if one is inspired by the other, that just makes it all the more sweeter for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, we accept the mission. <laughs> Good. I Excellent. expect a report back. <laughs> So I, I guess brothers grin while while we're you, you while we're with you. Why don't you give us your uh, assessment of the world building here? Mm, well, a lot has already been said. I remember yeah. um, when Dad was just setting out writing um, at Shadow of the Gods before he'd really got into it. I remember him just describing to us both this idea of a fortress within a dead god's skull, and I yeah. got goosebumps. I was like, this is awesome and then yeah when he'd written the first few chapters and I think with Elva on the wave y'all and the fortune just comes into view yeah just that is one of the moments that really just sticks with me like the most fantasy thing just, you can like, think of well, it's <laughs> exactly, like yeah. in a dragon yeah. scroll <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah I, I just love that contrast between as we said that Shadow of the Gods it can be very intimate and small scale and then it just opens up this epic mm -hmm. factor and it just brings everything in yeah. yeah, what's funny um, is dad will be standing there making a cup of tea and then he'll look at us and go, what about a mountain range, you know, made out the spine of a giant snake? And we're like, yeah, sounds cool. And then he just turns back to his tea and he'll be stirring. And then we kind of look, sometimes he comes out with, you know, some dark things. He's like, I might put this into my book. And then we all kind of look at him like, okay. Um, so you never really know what he's actually thinking, uh, which is always funny. <laughs> um, but I absolutely love the world building in this. Uh, the name Going Back Mountains reminds me of um, A Song of Ice and Fire, kind of the, the pragmatic approach to the names mm -hmm. um, in Westeros, like Hard Home. I just yes. love that name uh, as a place. And even though it's so simple, you, it just, you, you see so much in your mind just by, just by that name. So, yeah, the Going Back Mountains, it's awesome. Um, and, you know, we love reading history and, and nonfiction um, especially in, you know, the kind of the Viking age, Old Norse, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, although we're not as blessed as, as you, Philip, unfortunately, but maybe one day. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> you definitely see in, in the sagas the kind of pragmatic and, and quirky approach, I think, and especially in the, in the mythology as well. So, uh, yes. Jimmy, if you read Neil Gaiman's mythology, I think you'll definitely see um, it's yeah. very different to many other mythologies, um, even though it's a similar kind of pantheon with, uh, all sorts of gods, but they, they feel very um, individual, I think, compared to other mythologies. So, very cool. and I just love how Dad's kind of trickled. You know, he's taken the mythology and the history and tweaked it or made it his own. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, I think we still have Sarah and Alex to talk about the world building. So, uh, Sarah, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I agree with a lot of what everybody has been saying. It's a very visceral type of world building. You can really imagine the setting. It's very easy. As Jimmy said, I'm not the most um, image-based reader. I find it hard sometimes to visualize what it is that I'm reading, but it was not an issue here. This was a very immersive writing and very immersive world building and the setting um, I'm from Newfoundland and it reminds me the the environment and the the scrub and the forests and everything is very similar to I'm actually from the northern kind of tip of Newfoundland, which is very similar. There's actually a Viking settlement up there. Yes. Um, and uh, it's very similar in terms of world building. And as I was reading about these characters going about, I could just visualize it being the same kinds of pieces of land that I had walked on when I was younger. And it was very, very well done, very immersive. And I like that everything seems to contribute to the world building. As Patrick said, the language that's used, the creatures that appear, the magic, the characters, they all feel like part of the setting. Um, and, and that is really what I found most impressive about the world building. It just, it completely wraps you up. Everything is complimentary in this book for sure. Yep. I agree. Excellent point. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. And I, I feel like the one of the strongest points of the world building here is really just the way that he wrote the book, because I feel like 
where in Malice, it was sort of lacking in some description of, you know, what characters look like, what sort of, what some of the settings look like. I feel like he took the time to actually detail what you're looking at in this book. So I had a, between that and just watching Vikings in the last kingdom and just (laughs) seeing all the Viking stuff that I'm used to, it was really easy to picture and feel right at home walking through these towns and villages and seeing what the characters look like and just getting those little trickles of, of magic and, and sort of the build up throughout the book really tells you that there's going to be sort of a massive expansion. At least that's what I'm assuming is going to happen based on the ending of just how much larger this whole world and conflict is going to become because it did feel a little bit smaller scale, but I feel like that's really going to open up and who knows how big it will get, but, but just, I, I definitely second everything that you guys said and, and just the description really stuck out for me. Nice. Excellent. So now we're going to get to what we've all been waiting for, which is to talk about the characters. Yes. And there are three, three POV characters in here. There's Varg and Elvar and, of course, Orca. And we'll talk about them in that order. And while we discuss these three POV characters, feel free, guys, to bring in any insights about any of the, the supporting characters around them. So when we talk about Varg, we can talk about the Bloodsworn and, and Svik and who Svik is based on and all of that stuff. Uh, so <laughs> so let's, let's start then with Varg. And I love this guy. And by the way, in, in case you didn't know, his name is a big clue as to his identity. Varg simply means wolf in Old Norse. It's uh. the same, same word as warg in, in Tolkien. Uh, it's the cognate with warg. Uh, it's, so in Old Norse, it's Varg. Uh, so that was a hit there all along as to who he was. Uh, so Jimmy, Jimmy knew about it. Yeah, <laughs> right over the head. Yeah, I've had entire conversations about this. All, all the worst <laughs> terminology were just were there. Yeah, we actually have a paper coming out. So. Peer reviewed. <laughs> we look peer reviewed. We were looking forward to that. Uh, but let's let us start then with the brothers Gwyn and their assessment of Varg and his induction into the blood sworn that whole thread that whole narrative in the shadow of the gods can we go first okay um yeah. uh, I, I really love with varg how he's thrust into a setting that is so alien to him and so it's like as you're going through the book as you, you as a reader adapt him to the world so is he and obviously you your sympathies are with him and i find his story really compelling obviously he's been accepted into the blood sworn but He's not sure to trust them. And he's obviously got this other agenda why he's there the right. whole time that throughout it keeps coming back, but um, it's not explored fully. And I just think that he, when you can, uh, the, the way he interacts with the Bloodsworn um, with characters like Svik and Rakia and how they treat him. So uh, how they both take very different approaches to him and how he's like, what is really going on? Um, and I just love his storyline throughout. And again, the hint of Varg. Um, and when you get to the ending and um, find out he's tainted, it just all falls into place. Beautifully, yeah. What do you think, Ed? Yeah, I really like Varg. I think his moral compass is kind of the most faithful and fallen-esque um, out of all of the point of views, um, which uh, I really liked. And I always like um, Dad's characters. I think um, I kind of preferred the other two to start with and then Varg really grew on me, especially as he kind of was thinking less about his goal, which is to um, have an Akal performed um, by Galdaman or a Seether witch um, to relive his sister's final moments. And I think as you saw him kind of becoming less of the slave who he was used to and more of just the human being, you know, and growing close to the Blood Swan, uh, I really loved that. And obviously the supporting cast around the Blood Sword are, are excellent. I really enjoy them. And Svix is a bit hit and miss, but um, the rest of them are pretty cool. <laughs> For those of you who haven't picked up on it, uh, Svik is uh, a character whose sense of humor, we have heard, is based on Ed. So, uh, and and the cheese thing. I didn't know about the cheese. Oh, man. <laughs> and the love of cheese. I used to play Skyrim as a, as a teenager. I'd just have a, have a stick of cheese next to me. So I'd <laughs> have a few nibbles on that every so often. <laughs> <laughs> but oh you never gosh. never encountered a troll i i assume uh, not yet okay very good <laughs> okay alex what did you think of varg 
I like them a lot. Can you still hear me? Because my battery just died in my camera. <laughs> You're frozen. Actually, we you can look beautiful. hear you, but you are frozen. I, I can move Oh, on. that's so cool. There it goes. Okay. Go to somebody else. Let me switch my batteries. You got it. We will. This is we, embarrassing. No, no worries. <laughs> These things happen on Zoom. So Sarah, how about you? What did you think of Varg? I love Varg. Varg is my favorite character for sure. Um, I will try not to talk too much. I I really, really, really sure? loved his arc. Um, I like, so watching him in his initial journey as he encounters the blood sworn and he tries to integrate himself into what is basically his first attempt at genuine human connection other than you know his his relatives but his his first attempt at integrating himself into any type of society yeah. and I thought that the way that John Gwynn did this was phenomenal his the way that it takes him time to know what the rules of this society are how to interact with people and that trying to build that trust his own internal struggle with trying to trust the people who are being so kind to him and who he feels this connection with, but also trying to maintain this oath, which has been essentially the only thing that is sustaining him at this part of his life. It's such yeah. a good struggle yeah. to watch. Yeah. Definitely, I, I can see how his moral compass does kind of keep in line with the characters from The Faithful and The Fallen. But I, I really enjoyed, and I don't know if this was intentional or unintentional, but I thought that the way that he lost control as he kind of left his life as a thrall and journeyed into his life as a member of, of society, I think that that's very reflective of someone who goes through a massive trauma and somebody who has been isolated and subjugated and not allowed to to be human. He's been dehumanized, essentially. And I thought that it was very fitting that it was as he discovered this alternative part of his personality, these powers, these godly powers, it's only when he becomes human or when he's treated as human, he reaches that, that level and he's able to recognize those powers within himself. And I thought that that was a very interesting parallel and a very interesting journey for him. I thought I I cannot wait to see what happens with his characters. I find myself imprinting on a character every time I read a John Gwynn book, and it was Bleda <laughs> in um, the last series. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, I will enjoy Varg's story the same way that I did enjoy his. But he is my favorite character so far. I know I I love Orca too. A lot of people have a lot of love for Orca, but I just thought that the way that he executed his storyline was so so good. Yeah. And he's fitting in many ways, again, the Icelandic saga kind of thing. A lot of the protagonists in the sagas are misfits and outcasts and oddballs yeah. and that sort of thing. So his, his narrative really struck home for me too. Jimmy, what did you think of Varg? Uh, so immediately, uh, Varg was the character based on the situation he comes out of, you know, obviously being underneath slavery uh, and then wanting to know what happened to his sister like immediately that's the character i'm like i'm most interested give me more varg like i want more varg chapters i would say orca ends up being my favorite by the end hmm. but varg's the one that that got me sold right out the get-go right and then i mean everyone here everyone listening to this should go subscribe subscribe to sarah because that it, yeah. that was an amazing analysis of that character like i He's can't so really good. So yeah good. i can't really follow <laughs> that up but what i will yeah. say <laughs> and this is a broader spectrum to just the characters in general that, that I'm going to talk about here. But John Gwen went with Varg specifically, but also with Orca uh, and Elvar. D did you guys notice that we didn't get any flashbacks? We didn't get big info dumps, but all of the plot moving forward revealed the past because this is very much figuring out who these people were. We didn't know who they were when we jumped in their brains, right? When we're, when yeah. we're in their POVs. Um, and instead of doing an info dump, instead of being an exposition, -y, it comes out through dialogue and where they find themselves in the world and how they're interacting with their with their environment. Yeah. And that's how we get the history. This book is very much Shadow of the Gods is very much about figuring out the motivations of the characters because of their past and who they are and where they belong in the world and where they've been in this. Because this world, that's the best thing about this world. It actually feels like it's existed for a very long time. And we're getting a history lesson just through three people's eyes. Yeah. which is really, really neat. And that is something that makes this book and John Gwynn special is the fact that there isn't, a, I, I, I really don't like flashbacks. Like I'm really not a fan. Uh, they really? can be done well. 
Uh, the Dark Tower just had one. I liked it, but I still would have been preferring the plot to move forward, right? Um, John Gwynn is moving the plot forward, telling us what's happened, for example, like to Vark, because you want to know. Yeah, you know, I mean, immediately he's someone where you're like, okay, where has this guy been and what happened to, you know, his beloved sister? Uh, and then with Orca, obviously by the end of the book, we figure out what's going on with her. Yeah. And then you look at Elvar and Elvar is, you know, you know, we, we can talk about Elvar in a second, but, you know, she has that, uh, that lineage, right? So it's just so cool that as a whole, the character work here is also a commentary on the history of the world and the history of the characters without taking the time to do a, you know, a hundred page flashback or do a big old info dump. Like this character was here. It all comes out through the relationships, which is John Gwynn's strongest point is his relationships and Varg to me for intro and motivations and knowing where, where he wants to go and what he wants to do. He was the best intro in the book. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And Jimmy, you actually just hit on another feature of Icelandic sagas, which is the objective narrator there. They were the original show don't tell uh, type narration. So mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely something that I loved about the shadow of the gods as well. Uh, let's see, we still have Patrick and Alex is back, of course. So uh, good to have you back. Looking good. <laughs> so uh, Patrick, why don't you go ahead and then we'll finish this. Uh, we'll finish uh, Varg with Alex. Uh, I don't have much else to add here, but uh, I think uh, I have to relate this to the uh, the thing that Sarah said at the beginning about escalation that John Gwynn implemented into his book. I yeah. think it, escalation is the one that we really see in uh, Var's development in this book. And in the beginning, we already saw him uh, insanely fighting Einar the half troll. Like, what was he thinking? <laughs> that was insane. That was, uh, when I was and reading what that, was described when... in that fight, Patrick. What? What was described during that fight? Was there part of this this uh, creature he was fighting that was described several times? Uh, yeah. <laughs> troll testicles. Thank you. <laughs> Let's just say Maybe, it. Sound just says it. <laughs> yeah, but my point is, is that we already know that there is a lot of motivation behind his action to make him want to do that. And I'm already so curious to know about him. Uh, and it gets better and better the more the book uh, yeah. went by. Because, well, as everyone has said, this is kind of like his first human connection. And yeah, I think uh, Bark Story is really good. And I think... Uh, Jimmy touched on a really good thing that everything in this book is shown through the dialogues, the actions, and yeah, there's no flashback. And by the end, when Orca's revelation happened, we, I, I mean, I didn't see it coming, but we should have seen it coming, but I didn't. It, it, was, it was all there all along. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was so good. So good. Nice. Yeah. And Alex... What did you think of Varg? And actually, why don't you go ahead and do Elvar next? We'll, we'll let you sure. finish Varg and begin Elvar. So without adding, you know reiterating everything that was just said about Varg, I, just, I enjoyed his growth probably the most out of the characters because he kind of starts off as not necessarily weak, but like he's kind of the, the character that isn't that good at what he's trying to do and gets his ass kicked quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> but he, he really grows throughout the book. And obviously by the end of it, you understand why he, you know, has sort of the, the determination and that, that want to that's inside of him to, to get his revenge and, and sort of make his way through this, this tale that we're reading. Um, as far as Elvar, she, I feel like had a lot of growth as well in the sense that like, I feel like Orca is, is my favorite, but like, you kind of know who she is throughout the book. She doesn't necessarily like her because she's older her personality doesn't necessarily change all that much elvar i feel like because of like her her past and, and the what is revealed about her hmm. it, it's sort of a, a weird position to be in with the um the sort of like barbarian what what are this is it the battle blood grim. or is it the, the battle grim. battle grim. the battle grim, sorry like her being involved in that it's it's almost like a fish out of water it's like she doesn't necessarily belong there but you sort of learn a lot about like why she wants to be there and learning, you know, to be part of the shield wall and the battle grim themselves just are super interesting and probably like the, some of the coolest like battles and stuff happen because of them. And mm -hmm. just, I don't know, I, I'll let you guys go further because my memory is failing me at the moment, but I, I do remember just <laughs> her involvement in the battle room was just a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. De def definitely. That's a great feature of her 
arc. I thought so too. Uh, let's see who wants to be, uh, let's go in reverse order here. Patrick, what did you think of Elvar? Uh, I have to admit that Elvar's story took me a while to get to uh, because uh, at first when we see her uh, actions, uh, her story well, her story started with full of actions, but we didn't really see her motivation yet until we reached that, uh, you know, that fantasy place. Uh, <laughs> yeah, until we reached that fantasy place and we know why she wants to be in the battle grim, then yeah, at that point, I became invested in her story. And then I realized that, ah, so this is why the beginning started like this. And I think there is a lot of similarity between uh, Elvar and Vark's story in that both of them are found family. Uh, Battle Grimm and, ba and the Bloodsworn are found family for both these characters. Yeah. And yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the, the character's development. I enjoyed the plot. And by the end, I think Alvar's story was one of the best one because yeah, mm -hmm. insane stuff happening in her storyline. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And and her relationship with Grend is beautiful too. Yes. Yeah. It, like someone said earlier, the relationships are fantastic. And Agnar as well. And I was kind of sad to see him go there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'll let uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, why don't you give us your assessment of uh, the Elvar arc? Well, Elvar was definitely at the beginning my least favorite, right? And, and we're also seeing like less POVs. I believe she had less POVs, at least at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like trying to get my footing with Elvar. And then when you figure out her heritage and then her dad is, a, what is it, a duke or what's the, yeah. the phrasing? Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. So <laughs> that's why she's with uh, the uh, Battle Grim or, or whatever. I always forget. Um, yep, you got it. Yeah. So, and then the cool thing about Elvar is as soon as you realize that all of the relationships around her start to make a lot more sense. Yeah. And yeah. It, I like the fact that she has a connection to Grend who has a connection mm -hmm. to her heritage. It's not just some random guy. I'll take care of you, darling. You know, it's not, it's not like that. It's not cheap. <laughs> it's very much more rooted in her history. Again, we're getting history through <laughs> relationships. I mean, it's pretty cool. Right. right. Um, and then Elvar's end. I know Orca. Orca has a. Uh, we, we lost, lost the brothers those. Gwen. They went They'll on their. Be back. They'll be back. They went on their mission for me. They're they're that talking to Papa Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the thing about it, I liked about Elvar though is at the end it feels like I mean Orca's stuff's amazing. Like the revelation with Orca, which we're about to talk about, is is yeah. tremendous. But Elvar's ending, where Bajor, is that how you say it? I'm. I'm Bjor. Yeah. Bjor. Yeah. Oh, we'll go with that. Uh, Bjor. Uh, <laughs> you know, when he stabs Agnar through the mouth yeah, yeah. and you're just like, <laughs> Gren, you, cause we, yeah. I mean, come on. We all thought Gren was being a little possessive. Like, Hey, back off Gren. It's young love, you know, right. Uh, <laughs> they, they let these two cats do the thing. And it turns out that Gren's got a sixth sense for treachery. apparently. <laughs> yeah. And that was just such a monumental moment. And I really liked. So if we remember Elvar was faced with the decision, stick with the family or stick with her band, right? Yeah. Now, do you remember when uh, Bjor, I'm, I already forgot to say it, uh, kills Agnar. Don't say the J. <laughs> Bjor. <laughs> uh, and Bjor said, and she said, Bjor, why? Why would you do this? Well, he was a, he was a slaver. He deserved it. And yeah. she's like, you know, but what about us? You know, what about your band? And he just says, join us. Mm. She gets the decision again, mm -hmm. right? And now we know for sure where her loyalty lies. And I just thought that was really excellent. And then Gren still being floored in, in reality, being like, we need to get out of here unless you want to die here today with Agnar. Uh, I just thought like that twist was actually really awesome. I really enjoyed it. I didn't see it coming. Um, I thought there was something up there, but I wasn't sure. And then uh, he also, uh, Bjor stabbed the gentleman in the back. I'm forgetting his name. I can't, I think it was an H. But they found a stab wound in one of the their allies' right. back, and right, they thought right, that was right. weird. And it, it turns out it was him, just like a little subtle piece of the action, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's why I get a little bit offended when people say, "Oh, John Gwynn just writes a lot of battle scenes." People just like battle scenes. It's like, no, 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 no. They they all have <laughs> a perp. I mean, they're sweet, but they all have a purpose, and they do for the plot, the characters, and the situation every single time. And yeah. that is a really good example of that, I think, because that played a huge role in Elvar's revelation, sitting there standing at your who just stabbed Agnar through the damn mouth. I mean, like, like, that was like, kind of like, wow, this guy is, this guy's been treacherous for a long time. Absolutely. Um, so Elvar's ending, in my opinion, was the best. It was cool. And it's interesting too, because I think what you brought up made me think about how this is not good versus evil. Bjor has 
a, a, a genuine grievance here. The tainted have been treated horribly. That's right. Yeah. So it, this, this is not simple, good, evil. This is a lot of, these are people, they're complex. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sarah, you're going to be next. Uh, the brothers hopefully will be back. And uh, Sarah, please tell us what you think of Elvar's um, arc. And I will be right back. If the brothers come back, just have them go next. I have to just do something real quick. I'll be right back. But Sarah, please tell us what you think of Elvar. Sure, sure. Um, I agree with everybody's general initial impressions of Elvar. It's definitely the story that is the, it takes the most time to become invested in. I do like that a lot of the moral conflict in the story comes from Elvar. And I think, mm -hmm. Jimmy, that's what makes her story so good at the end is you're seeing this struggle between what is right and wrong, essentially, in, in terms of the tainted. And that's something that I had felt a little bit uncomfortable with throughout the story, the way that they're treated and even the people that you are following and the people that you like, they're still misusing this group to their own, mm -hmm. you know, their own advancement. They want to get something from them. So you get a lot of that moral conflict through Elvar's character, which I really enjoyed. And I like the parallels between Elvar and Varg, because with Varg, we see someone who has had no real secure attachment in his early life. And we see how that plays out in terms of his development of relationships with other, with other people. But with Elvar, we see someone who has had a home that provides everything that she needs monetarily, but nothing that she needs emotionally. So we see this neglect as opposed to a lack, which Varg, have, which Varg had, we see this neglect in Elvar and that definitely influences the types of relationships that she wants to build. She wants the Battlegrim to accept her for her capabilities, for her acts of heroism. And you can see how that reflects back on how she was not valued by her own parents, how she was seen as a commodity. She wants to be seen for what she can do with the Battlegrim. And I think that's what makes those ties so strong. And I, I have to say, I was texting, so Petra kind of got a live update as I was reading this book, and I was texting him, I said, oh, yours bad news, this guy, nope, something, <laughs> he is, something is going to happen, and when it happened, I was like, yes, I knew it, but I'm also sad because I can get behind his motivation, I can understand yeah, yeah, yeah. why, I don't, I didn't like his execution, but I, I can understand why he did that, yeah. and it was a really heartbreaking moment, and that always seems to happen at the end of these books, but <laughs> I oh, love I had a really fun Elvar moment. So this is as I was just starting to chat with Petrick and we got to the point where she gets to her home and the giant's head is there. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, Petrick, her dad's a giant. And he was like, what? No, <laughs> like, no he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. I was like, oh, I'm the dumbest person alive. Like Petrick's not even going to want to talk to me after this. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Sarah, I was just thinking that if I ever need a psychiatrist, I'm going to Newfoundland. Uh, <laughs> so. I, I'm just, I'm, I was listening to your assessment even <laughs> off camera and it's just brilliant. So thank you so much, uh, yeah. really great. And we have the Brothers Gwyn back. So guys, what do you think of Elvar? Sorry, yeah, sorry for cutting out there. Oh, no worries. Uh, uh, straight off the bat, Elvar for me was my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I love seeing kind of everyone, hearing everyone's different opinions, which is, um, which is a great thing about the books, I think. And Elvar straight away felt to me um, the most kind of authentic to, the old Norse style of characters where she's out there seeking the battle fame and, and the glory um, within her, her sea chest, that kind of thing. Uh, and straight away, I just absolutely loved the setting she was thrown into. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a kind of nearly coming of age uh, style with her where she's the, one of the youngest members of the war band. Uh, yeah. And no matter how much you dislike someone, uh, you don't want to see them die by pendulous troll testicles, do you? So <laughs> I wanted her to win straight on. <laughs> uh, although jail maybe hey from the fallen maybe that's a good way that he could have died but uh, <laughs> maybe one day yeah yeah i, yeah, I really enjoyed elva yeah from what you're saying the idea of that um elva felt really authentic um i really enjoyed that she wasn't as driven by honor or exuding virtues um as varg as we said he may be a bit more online uh, with the faith from the fallen but elva she's much more concerned with proving herself um, and again, the parallel, the how Varg and Elva 
mirror each other that idea of how they're inspired by family but in very different ways and we'll talk about orca um in a few minutes and it's similar with that i love how family is at the heart of every motivation yeah that they change the character in very different ways and elvaz is even if she doesn't feel very close to her family she wants to prove a point that she can survive on her own and that she is worthy um and i thought that's just another whilst um she may not be the warmest of characters um, I thought it was another very compelling and really interesting motivation. Yeah, I think Elva was the most kind of Uhtred, son of Uhtred, son of Uhtred kind of character. <laughs> um, with, with that motivation, you know, and straight away, you didn't need to know too much about her. She just, she wanted to, to win fame and glory. And by the end of the book, she's done it in a way that's not so in your face, where it doesn't feel like she's OP or anything, you know. Uh, everyone was a part of killing the troll but she gets the final blow so she's known as the troll slayer and that feels very kind of authentic to that kind of period you can imagine that happening in a band of warriors you know so yeah I liked Elva yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens with her in book two given the losses she's experienced at the end of this book Um, so whether her her desire for glory might not be a bit altered it will be very interesting to see Um, so Excellent. And I think now it's time to talk Orca. So I don't know who wants to go first here, uh, but let's go with Jimmy. Jimmy, what did you think of Orca? Uh, I think a lot of people made this, but it's like Liam Nielsen, like female Viking. Liam I mean, from Taken. Yeah, Neeson from Taken, right? Like it, 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 I love revenge stories. I mean, topic. yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I like revenge stories. And this is your classic revenge story with a lot of, you know, a lot of Norse spin on it. And there, and, and to say it's only a revenge story is probably a little cheap, right? But um, I think without a doubt, Orca is my favorite character. And a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, John Gwynn did a great job of painting her surroundings and that, you know, she's with her husband and she's with uh, Brecca and her son. And, and her husband's name's Thorkel, which I think is hilarious. I don't know why. Then that name cracks me up. For, I think of Urkel. That's what I think. Um, but I love the fact that they're just, they just want to be left alone. They want to be out doing their own thing, surviving. They've clearly tried to escape a past, which then we figure out at the end of the book, right? Uh, with Orca. And it's just one of those things where I, I can kind of relate. Sometimes I want to be left alone. Like sometimes I just want to, uh, you know, me and my wife go, I want to go to Montana or maybe Newfoundland uh, and just uh, <laughs> an escape. And it's like, it's like a, a, some sort of like gravity is pulling her back into violence. And, and it just so happens that uh, when you don't leave her alone, she strikes back and she strikes back. Mm. Hard. <laughs> hard. And I love, and, and John could have easily just done Orca going around assassinating people, yada, yada, yada. But he balanced it so well with the the two boys from town. Uh, I, I forget their names, but when they're on the boat, right? And she's like basically pigeonholed into like helping them. That relationship was awesome. I thought it really helped round out her character. It showed a more soft side, even whenever she's in a revenge driven state. And it made it made everything all the way up into the very end to where you find out who she is. Yeah, uh, mean a lot more. So yeah. uh, I loved Orca. I just those chapters were so easy to read. Yeah, yeah. Her two companions are are Leaf and Mord. Yes. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, uh, and Thorkell. I think it's clear enough at by the end with that revelation that Thorkell is all splitter, and that um, they were members of the Blood Sworn, and, and, mm-hmm. and they're trying to get away from it all. Um, so yeah. beautiful. Okay, Orca. Uh, who's next? Uh, let's see. How about the brothers? What did you guys think of Orca? Well, as you, uh, Jimmy, as you're saying about classic revenge story, I mean, I think that even though we've seen it loads, it's it's just always a great story, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And again, with the family at the heart of that, you just completely understand that she is on this quest and nothing is going to stop her. I mean, my favourite scene of the entire book is where she walks into the dead Drenger, I think it's called, yeah. and um, the tavern, and that is just my favourite scene. And it, it's just everything that Orca is about, that she does not care what is in front of her she just knows that (laughs) (laughs) she just knows nothing will stop her um and again i really love the relationship of lip and ward because whilst orca is the most impressive character in terms of the feats she's capable of it shows that she she doesn't lack a heart she sometimes she feels too much emotion um and she sometimes has just forced herself to keep on track um and i think orca is my favorite character um 
just because of the amount of nuances that, um, and so much there's so much more to be explored with her um again with as with all of the characters you find out the motivations as you go through and there's so much more to see in Volka. yeah brilliant yeah i think sorry for that you go Oh, I just wanted to make sure you guys knew that even though you're sometimes frozen, uh, we can the audio is fine. We can hear you guys yeah. really well. So, um, okay, so great. Please go ahead, Ed. Uh, I think uh, Orca for me was kind of Logan, uh, Wolverine, Hugh Jackman's Logan, um, meets <laughs> the Punisher. Yeah. And I just, oh, <laughs> such good characters. And when she walked into the dead Drenga, I was just like, holy smoke. It was just <laughs> amazing, that scene. And I, I just love her punch up with Drekka. And Drekka is seems like a bad, bad guy. Um, and I just love how she just took everyone on, walks into a pub and just starts beating the hell out of everyone. Yeah. Um, just, it, I just, I was kind of, it was close to laughter, but when, you know, it was not funny when she's going in and decapitating everyone, but, you know. Um, and I just, I think she's such a cold hearted character sometimes, even though she's got that emotion burning within her for her son. Um, I love when she, uh, I think she shows that she can be a bit more brutal when she cuts off someone's head, doesn't she? And she says, the cleaved head no longer plots. No longer plots. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I love that line. Yeah. Uh, it's so good. And uh, her journey to the end of the story, you feel like there's so much more to her, but she doesn't want to focus on that. She just wants to focus on her goal, which is Brecker. And, and you, you feel it's going to take her into even deeper waters. Yeah. And I love the, the surrounding characters as well. We said Liff and more, but also... Vesley and Spur. I love <laughs> yeah. them. Just those quirky characters. I love them so the, much. The teeth fairy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I also love how, you know, when she goes into the tavern and just goes berserk, uh, literally, uh, there's, <laughs> she gets made fun of a little bit by Mord and, and Lif, who <laughs> basically, that's not deep cunning there, right? That's a deep yeah. cunning <laughs> Uh, Got to use her thought cage a little more. Uh, so, okay. yeah. yeah, I thought that was really well done. The relationship between them, and, and there is humor in here too, by the way, which is good humor. Really, yeah. it's that it's that saga understated humor that I really love. Uh, so it's good stuff. Okay, so let's see. We still need uh, Alex. Uh, what did you think of Orca? Well, she was my favorite character, and I love the death and the destruction that uh, was left behind in her path. Uh, but to, to one of Jimmy's points that what I was thinking of when I read her too, to the point of like, she keeps trying to get away and kind of like hide from her past, but like it keeps drawing her back in reminded me a lot of sort of like what Logan nine fingers goes through in yeah. first law of like, he keeps trying to be a better person, but like circumstances, whatever have you prevents that from happening. And even Ragnar from the show Vikings, where, you know, he goes from being a warrior and a Jarl to sort of just like farming with his family. And then, he, you know, somebody's just like, nope, I'm going to kill your family. So it's like, <laughs> oh, now I'm just going to be a warrior again. Right. So it's, it, that's a great parallel for me that I just saw like while reading her and you really feel for her. Like she is like the, like the brother said, she's not going to stop for anything. Like she's going to find her family. And I worry for anybody in her path because as <laughs> she's been compared to, whether it's, taken or john wick like she's gonna kill pretty much everybody and she has the power and the will to do it uh she is violent as hell that was some of the best action of the entire book was just her relentless almost like tau like rage of dragons like i'm just gonna jump in and start fighting people and i'll think about it later um i i just i loved her character i i absolutely love where she's going and and i like that john in his three POVs chose to do two female POVs and, and the one younger male POV, just because you don't get a lot of like older female POV uh, characters in fantasy. And just to see how much of a badass she is because it's a Norse mythology. She's not, it's not weird. That she's like a warrior or that, you know, the blood sworn have women fighting. Like this is totally normal and they're, they're all excellent at it. And I just, I really attach to her character the most. So that's, I just, I liked her the most because I, I think he's, He's done such a good job of creating her as one of the best written characters that he's done in all of the works that I've read so far. And she's just a really intriguing person to read. And I can't wait to see where she goes from book one now that we know that she was blood sworn, that she is tainted. Like everything that we found out about her, like she's going to be a badass, <laughs> definitely yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's great praise. Uh, so Patrick, and then we will let Sarah finish. Yeah, uh, I... I 
Orca is definitely my favorite character because uh, as Alex has said that she reminded me a lot of Logan Nine Fingers. Logan is one of my favorite characters of all time. And I know that John Gwynn also loved the first law series by Joe Abercrombie. And I think it's really great to see a mother figure in fantasy that's powerful and has a strong personality because, well, uh, the truth is that parents of, uh, often get killed in fantasy books. A lot, a lot of times they get killed. And it's always refreshing to see uh, a mother's overflowing love for their child. It's always refreshing whether it's a, a dad or mother. Uh, and both Torkel and Orca, both of them love Breka so much. And it shows uh, even before uh, Torkel was killed, uh, it happens very quickly, but yeah, it, it was already displayed that both of them really care about Breka in their own way and nothing will stop Orca. And I think what makes Orca's story so good is the contrast, is that Orca's story differs a lot from Dwarf and Elva, a lot. Her story is very simple. She wants to protect her family. She wants to rescue Breka, that's it. She will stop at nothing and she will make sure that she's going to get that she's going to get her kid back and that's it but the contrast between her pov and the other pov make her story so much more engaging and as always john Gwynn always delivered on characterizations and yeah i think uh orca is definitely my favorite character of the of the book i loved it so much every part with her uh, chapters absolutely enthralled me non-stop <laughs> yeah. yeah great she, there's a lot of orca love here uh what did you think sarah I really, I really like Orca's character. One thing that I liked about it, and this is something that I've seen in all of John Gwynn's books, is that he has this way of describing fear and integrating fear into his characters and showing how fear and courage are often parts of the same coin instead of opposites. They, they complement each other. And I think a lot of Orca's rage and, again, if we want to talk psychodynamics, a lot of rage in general comes from repressed anxiety and from fear and we can see that orca her biggest fear has happened her child has been taken she moved away from a certain life from trauma that clearly still plagues her because we see her have those dreams and those flashbacks at the beginning of the story she's tried to soften and temper her emotions so that she can raise a son who feels cared for but also is tough to the world and she can see that he is maybe a little gentler than her and she's trying to make him hearty and, and make him able to survive. And then her worst fear comes to life. And we see this explosion of rage that, that follows. And I think a lot of her action is driven by that fear. And I really, really like seeing that in characters in fantasy. I like when the really horrible things that they've done have impacts on them because those things do impact people. Mm -hmm. They, you yeah. can't cleave people's heads off and chop in their skulls and like that can happen and not have an impact on you. And we yeah. see that through Orca and even so, she gets, she pushes all that away to, to go and find her son and go on this mission. And I know um, at least some of, some of the other people in this chat are parents as well. And it feels like parenthood goes hand in hand with fear sometimes, even if you're not an overly anxious person, the, the fear that you have that something can go wrong, or you're maybe not preparing your child in the way that they need to be prepared for the way that the world is, those are really real emotions and they start very early when your kids yeah. are really young. And I, I thought it was, it was really nice to see that here in those characters. So we see a really, a really good depiction of parenthood and also a, you know, a really epic character who gets to do a lot of cool <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I have a, uh, a daughter who is about Ed's age, 23, 24. And let me tell you, you never stop worrying. So <laughs> it's just how it is. Uh, you're a hostage to worry. Beautifully said, Sarah. All of you, thank you so much. And I don't know if anyone has any final thoughts. We've been going for a little over an hour, so we probably should wrap it up. But I would love to hear your final thoughts, and then we will say goodbye to everybody. Jimmy, final thoughts? 
Uh, I want to tack on something super quick about Orca. Uh, one yeah. really cool thing about Orca, we're saying revenge story over and over and over, saying she's going to go crazy, yada, yada, yada. But we also forget that she seems to refuse help. And I think to Sarah's point, it's because she doesn't want any more responsibility. She said, this is all I can handle right now. I don't want to be responsible for my animal companions. I don't want to be responsible for Liv and his brother. And even though she doesn't want any help, she needs it. And then they come in at a time where she needs it at the end of the book. And it, and you, you know what I mean? Like that's going to be something we explore more. My final thoughts are obviously I love this book and this has been super enlightening for me. I have a new take on some of the characters. I want to reread it right now, um, <laughs> which I may, uh, but I, I think I just want to, uh, you know, part with these predictions. I believe that Elvar is going to be the hero of the story. Uh, I think she is not tainted and maybe it'd be interesting to see if she ends up being tainted somehow or something, because then it would add a new, another nuance with uh, Bjor, which would be really interesting because he's obviously against people who are uh, going against the tainted. And here's my big prediction. I think Orca will die and we will get a Brecca POV and Brecca will replace her in the POVs. Wow. Now those are bold. Yes. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We I need to it. turn off uh, the Brothers Gwyn uh, video right now. Do no, not see, 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 it on Do not zoom, see their face. Zoom in on <laughs> and just make wild predictions. Yeah. And see what sticks. <laughs> it would be a bold, seriously, it would be a bold decision. Orca, to call Orca. is actually a dragon. Oh, my God. oh it's true it's true <laughs> i i think that orca to, to do that would be a super bold decision and the reason why i feel confident in that prediction is because john Gwyn makes bold bold moves so yeah, hey. yeah. Awesome. and he's not scared to kill people so nope yeah. we, know that. we know that that's one of the best thing about his books though <laughs> yep anyone else with final thoughts before we all think about the dragon at the end yeah oh my goodness that's a that's that's where the cover is from. Right? Exactly. Yeah. We got to talk about that the is dragon. A dragon. That is a real dragon. <laughs> That's a dragon. Yeah. That is epic. That is one really big dragon. That's massive. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions it's that me. I was getting early on when I started to read and review this, people were like, is there actually a dragon? It's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is. <laughs> it's in the it's cover. A <laughs> dragon. <laughs> Yep. It makes yeah. me want to buy three copies so I can line them up and have the dragon just all there. On ah, the yeah, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Good marketing. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. I still remember when Patrick did the cover reveal for Shadow of the Gods, and I was like, "Wow, that is one of the yeah. best covers I've ever seen." Yeah. 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 When I got when I got the cover art, I was so shocked because holy, holy moly, this dragon is massive. <laughs> 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 Because uh, the, the dude, uh, no, that's Alvar, right? That's uh, Alvar's fighting the dragon. It's like so small. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see? <laughs> of course, I like the one where they have Bernie Sanders sitting there. But... Yeah, that <laughs> one was pretty good. That was pretty fun. <laughs> my, um, when my copy, so my copy came early. I'm not sure why I pre-ordered it, but Chapters Indigo sent them out early. And when it got here and my kids saw that little tiny person and they know that I have been reading John Gwynn's books and they've seen me cry a lot. So, <laughs> so my daughter, her name is Juliet. She said, oh no, mom, this is going to be another death book. That guy be <laughs> that person. <laughs> I was like, probably. She's not wrong. Oh, that no. should be on the front cover. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, another death book. <laughs> oh no, another death book. <laughs> All right, well, but we're yeah. looking forward to we're all looking forward to the next death book uh, very much. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's just been so much fun listening to you all and, and interacting with you guys. You guys are among my, my favorites to watch on BookTube. So this has been a real pleasure. And I appreciate everything that I've learned from you. And I'm sure our audience will feel the same way. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.